Last week, Pastor Steve brought such an inspired message on that we have a great destiny. And he gave us a threefold of uh, how, you know, where, when, whom, about the destiny. Did that bless you? Yes, sir. And I really believe it awakened in some of you that there is a great destiny inside of you. How many of you that really stirred you up on the inside? And, and the thing I want to share this morning is how to walk in the fulfillment of that destiny. Because I do know how. And I've been walking in it for many years now. And so I can share it with you. And a lot of it's not anything new, nothing. You know, sometimes we're always thinking we want something so spectacular and so new. But like Brother Hagen always said, if you don't walk in the light you already have, God's not going to give you more light. In other words, what truth you do have, walk in that and then more will come. Because if we're not faithful in what we do know, God's not going to share any more with us. But if we're faithful in what we do know, and by that I mean we walk in it, we live it, we talk it, and, and as a result of it, we become doers of the word. And then when we walk in that truth, God reveals more truth to us. If we walk in that light, more light comes. And uh, so I want us to increase in knowledge. And as we increase in knowledge, we increase into the fullness of what Christ has called us to be. And all of our life on this earth is a constant change. Yes. We're being changed by the Holy Spirit from glory to glory into the image of the Lord. Think about what kind of change that is, that we are being changed to look like Jesus. We're being changed to be like the Son of God, the Son of Man. We're being changed to be like the Son of Man who became flesh and dwelt among us, who exalted it by the Father. His name above every name went back to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, but when he went back to heaven, he went back as a person who had never been there before. He went back as the Son of Man and the Son of God. And uh, so something new and fresh came back to heaven. Jesus, the firstborn among many brethren, that's us. And so he went back so that we could be conformed into his image and likeness as the Holy Spirit has been sent, the gift of the Father, to make sure that the Word of God becomes revelation to us, becomes spirit and truth. It's not just, uh, you know, ink on paper but we become a living epistle by the Holy Spirit. And every Christian should know what your destiny is. It's to be like Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So if you want to know what the completeness of your destiny is, it's look at Jesus and that's what the Holy Spirit is doing, making you just like him. Man, that's awesome. Isn't it right? Amen. And, but, on, it's, but on the earth, we have a calling. We have a purpose. We have a plan that God placed in us before the foundation of the world. And as uh, Pastor Steve said last week, you know, God did speak to Jeremiah and says, I knew you before you was ever born. I put you together in your mother's womb. Well, that's for all of us. That's not just unique to Jeremiah. That's for every born-again Christian. God knew us before we were ever conceived in our mother's womb. He knew us before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. And he predestined then a destiny, an eternal destiny to be with him forever and be like his son, but also a destiny on this earth. And on this earth, compared to eternity, it's just like a, I mean, it's like a flash and it's gone. But that little flash of time determines our future. If we don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ, we will have an eternal future separated from God. Because every human being is going to live forever. Some with eternal life, some with eternal death in the lake of fire. And that was determined not because God chose and says, well, I want this one saved, I want that one lost. I want... No, it's because he foreknew all of us. He knew our hearts. He knew what decisions we were going to make. He didn't make them for us. But in spite of seeing all those that's going to reject him, he still had to say, I've got to do this because for the sake of those who love me. And that's for us, church. Jesus came and died for all men, all women. Doesn't matter how bad or how good they are, he died for all of us. And 
And so it brings us to a place of compassion and mercy towards others. Because the same compassion and mercy the Lord had towards me, I, I need to have that same compassion and mercy towards you. The worst thing I've ever seen in Christianity is who Christians become religious and they get saved and, and they had a bad habit of whatever it was, smoking, drugs, alcohol, whatever it was, then they get saved and they'd condemn other people who were doing the same thing that they were doing before they got saved. That's crazy. That's a carnal Christian. Thank God I've been saved. I'll tell you what, I was a big mess. Headed to hell as fast as I get there. Loved the world and everything in it. But God. But God had a different plan for my life. And when Jesus came into my life by the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father, I became a new creation, and those old things passed away. And I understand then, have compassion, and absolutely can identify with people who were trapped in the same things I was trapped in. Or other things that maybe I wasn't trapped in, but I know the condition their condition is in. Amen? Because <laughs> my condition was in that at one time. But thank God I like the condition my condition is in now. It's in Christ Jesus. It's in the newness of life. It's in the fullness of the Spirit. The love of God is in my heart. The Word of God is a living epistle. I want everybody, if they read me, I hope they look, I look like Jesus. You ought to be able to be thankful for one thing. If someone comes up to you and says, man, you just remind me of the Lord, you ought to say thank you. Because what greater honor is there than someone would look at you and say, you're, lo you're like your master. <laughs> Are there still areas in your life that need perfected? Of course. We're going to continue till we leave this earth and be with Jesus. We will continually be conformed to this image and likeness. We will continually have more of the old man going to the cross where he's supposed to be and the new man taking place of him. We'll continually put off the old and put on the new. Thank God for God's grace and mercy that works in us. Amen. And it's not anything we did in our own strength. It's what he has done for us. And, and uh, there's many, been many times in my life with the Lord that I wasn't grateful for what he did for me. I'd get upset because things didn't go my way, just like a baby. Well, God, you said this, and I don't see it happening. So I'll throw a little flesh fit. Feel sorry for myself. Blame God for all my problems. Blame God that you didn't come and do this for me. But thanks be to God, his grace and mercy and his love was still towards me. He didn't get mad at me. He didn't get upset with me. He understood as a little baby he had to help me grow up with love. And the discipline of the word of God by the spirit that changed me into the image of Christ. The greatest thing God will ever do you in your life is not let you in a, stay in a situation you're in. He sees the beginning. He sees the end. He's standing at the finish line saying, come on. Come across the finish line. I already know my plans for you, saith God, for, for a future and a hope, right? So as we seek him with all of our heart, God is able to fulfill all of his purpose for us. The biggest, I think, heartache of God is when Rich Van Wickle doesn't let the Holy Spirit do everything God sent him to do in my life. I think it breaks the heart of the Father and the Son and grieves the Holy Spirit when I would allow anything else in my life to take preeminence over him. And, and whenever I'm doing that, thanks be to God, he reminds me that uh, I'm putting something ahead of him. And the good news is when he does that, I repent. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. And put that old thing off and let him feel Christ in my life. See, the biggest problem sometimes with Christians is we just think that God's mad at us when he corrects us. And he's not. Sometimes we get into condemnation because, oh, Lord, you know, I'm not perfect. And I'm not. And he said, of course I know that. I knew that before you were born. <laughs> Amen. I knew the condition you were in before you even got that condition before the foundation of the world. But I know what you're going to look like when I'm through with you. Like a beloved son and daughter, full of love, full of grace. A child that the father can just bounce on his knees and say, thank you, son, that you went and purchased your, with your blood this precious daughter or son of mine. You know, the blood of Jesus was shed for every human being that's ever born. Even Hitler and all those. God in his mercy would, 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 would not have them perish 
but they refused God, and as a result of it, they did perish. But not, they did on this earth, but forever they're going to be separated from God. God never wanted that, never intended it. His love is towards everybody, and our love should be the same. So all the people out there that acts out in the world, you can't expect them to do anything different. They're not saved yet. They don't have the destiny in them that you do. They have a different destiny, and if we don't bring Christ to them, it's a, it's a, it's a terrible destiny. It's a Christless destiny. And we have the ability and the privilege and the honor and the glory and the anointing to release Christ to somebody to bring them out of their situation into a better situation. Thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. I'll tell you one thing about God. He disrupted every one of my pity parties. When you invite Jesus to your party, a lot of parties leave. Pity parties, pride, all that stuff leaves because it can't sit at the table with Jesus. So if you're going to break bread with Jesus, you're going to be healed and healthy and happy and joyful and wonderful and blessed forever. That's the promise of God. So I want to read to you a scripture in Zechariah 4, 6. It says this, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, most of you know that scripture, but do we really understand that, folks, it's not by my might, it's not by my power, it's not by my strength, it's not by my goodness, it's by the Holy Spirit that, number one, I have a destiny. The Holy Spirit unlocks that destiny, brought Christ into me so that the destiny I had before the foundation of the world, now the Holy Spirit can unlock it and make it work. Thanks be to God. It's a matter, do I yield to the Holy Spirit, the only one who can fulfill the destiny in me? It's him doing it. He brought the destiny in me. He brought it into Jesus. Jesus said, though I come, and there's been a body prepared for me, and I've come to do the will of God. And the Holy Spirit put that destiny in Jesus and, and unlocked it, so that as the Son of Man, the destiny, it says everything Jesus did, he did through the Spirit. He did it through the Spirit. And the same way with us. Everything we do is through the Holy Spirit because it's the life of the Spirit that's in us, in our spirit. So it's not anything we can do in our... In fact, Rich Van Winkle's flesh will guarantee that the Holy Spirit is grieved. Because like Paul said, in my flesh there's no good thing. But in my spirit is the fullness of Christ, which can change my flesh, can change my soul, can change my heart, can change my body, so that God's purpose and plan works through me. And so that I don't have a purpose and plan other than to do his will, like Jesus said. Jesus said, I've come to do his will. He says, I don't, I don't consult my own will, the Amplified says, but only the will of him who sent me. So we come to the place as we grow in grace, and grow into our destiny, that we come to the place to say, Lord, only your will be done. Only your will. I'm not even consult. I don't have a will, so I don't have a will to consult. Because God, by the Holy Spirit, has placed that in us. So I'm saying to you and me and all of all Christianity that the only way that we have received a destiny is by the Holy Spirit. The only way we can fulfill that destiny is by the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't need our help. He needs us, our, us to assist him as a co-laborer. And that means he's the boss and we follow orders. Amen? Amen. So that's, that's, that's just the, the foundational. Go to, to 1 Thessalonians 5.24. Because I can tell you this. I'm like everybody else in this room. There have been times in my life when 1 Thessalonians 5.24... When I didn't do everything perfect, and I still don't do everything perfect, but I don't get upset when I don't do everything perfect because I understand he's the perfect one perfecting me. Yes. Amen. And 1 Thessalonians 5.24 is such a promise to us. It says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? 
in, our, in regards to our destiny, in fulfilling our destiny, it's God who called us, it's God who will fulfill it. You say, well, then what part do I have? Just obey. Obey and let God have his way. That old hymn, trust and obey. There's no other way. Just believe in Jesus and trust and obey. They asked Jesus, what, what, what do we do to do the works of God? And Jesus said, believe. Believe in me and the Father who sent me. If you do that, guess what? You'll do his works. Because believing means putting your whole life into him and trusting him and committing our way to him so that he has his way. The only one that can hinder your destiny in this room is you. Our problem is not sin itself. Our problem is not the devil itself. The devil's been destroyed. He's under our feet. We have dominion over sin. Sin has been done away with in our life. So what's the problem? S-E-L-F, self. It's the only thing left. So as we surrender to the will of God, self goes to the cross and stays there where it belongs. I, I don't want any of us, I don't want blood on my hands for any of you to go stand before the Lord and you cannot say to him, Some, nobody told me that I have to obey you. Grace is free, but it costs God the blood of his son. Grace works through humility. And the more we humble ourselves, grace, grace abounds. And it multiplies to the knowledge of God. So the more grace I have, the more humility I walk in, the more of the knowledge of God I have. And not only the knowledge of who God is, but what God, who God is in me and what God wants to do through me. Am I, are we all getting on the same page? So I marked this down today. When, we all, when you stand before the Lord and you say, I didn't know I was supposed to obey you, he's going to remind you of this date. Well, I had Pastor Rich tell you that obedience is better than sacrifice. Because in obedience, it's, it's the fullness of God, the fullness of love. This is good news. Amen. Faithful is he who called you. God called you. He will fulfill that calling. Well, what do we do? Obey. Surrender. Give our life to God. Now, turn to Psalms 37. This is, this is my psalm of release, of, of guidance. Uh, when I'm making a major decision, this psalm is what I use. Everything in my life is dependent upon this psalm. That's a pretty powerful statement. I want to live a life overwhelmed by the Lamb. I want to live a life that like in the book of Revelation that comes before the throne and says, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and power and dominion out of my life unto him. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb who shed his blood, who, who died and is now alive forevermore. Worthy is the lamb who sits at the right hand of God. Worthy is the lamb. And I want to live a life that's worthy of the lamb. I want to live a life that is overwhelmed by the Lamb of God. I don't want anything else that takes preeminence over the Lamb of God. Psalms 37, 5, 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That is powerful. Now, I want to tell you something. This is not speaking about your or my fleshly desires. It's talking about God-given desires that come out of delighting in Him. What you delight in, I want you, I want you to see the progress here in, in, our, in walking in our destiny. What you delight in will determine what you desire. 
Your delights will determine your desires. So if you're delighting in knowing God, wanting to fulfill the destiny of God in your life, guess what? Then your desires will follow that. Because where your treasure is or where your, where your uh, delight is, there's where your heart will be also. Wherever, whatever you delight in, that will determine your desires. Am I making sense? Yes, sir. I delight in pumpkin pie. <laughs> so when Thanksgiving comes, I'm going to fulfill my desire and eat a whole pumpkin pie. Say, that's horrible. I know, but I guess what? I probably won't eat another until next year. <laughs> what we delight in, church, will determine our desires. And the scripture says we are to delight in the Lord. The Lord becomes our delight. And, and when we delight in him, it means something. We know him. You can't delight in something or someone you don't know. Think about chocolate. You didn't delight in chocolate till you tasted it, right? And then you had a desire for chocolate. But you had to taste it first. And the Word of God says, taste the Lord. Taste Him. See that He's good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. So how do, how do I have the desire for the Lord? I must taste Him. I must delight. I must know Him. I must experience his love. I must experience his presence. I must experience the love of God. Am I making sense to you? And as I experience that love, guess what? My desires change because they're towards him and his will. So the delight of my heart being in the Lord determines what's going to be the desires of my heart. Now, that's a twofold situation. One is is in fulfilling your destiny. Lord, you've called me, so I'm just going to rest in you as you show it to me, and it comes out of the desires of your heart. For instance, I had a desire in my heart to be a pastor when I was a little boy. But as I walked away, didn't walk with God, and was in the fallen condition, that desire never left, but it never, it never caused me to do anything. But when I got saved... And delighted in the Lord, that desire became so strong that I quit teaching and went into the ministry. The other thing is this. That's, that, that's, the, that's the spiritual side of destiny. We have the gifts inside of us. We have the gifts of, of the Spirit in us. We have power in us. We have authority in Jesus' name. That's, that's, that's to every believer. But there's a, a unique calling on your life to fulfill a part of the body of Christ that only you can fulfill. That's your destiny. Because we're all destined to lay hands on a the sick. The, these signs shall follow those who believe. Those, those are, that's for the destiny of the church. But there's, then there's the unique destiny. I'm called a pastor. I'm called into the apostolic now too. But those are destinies that were on the inside of me. But the more I delight in the Lord the more he shows me those desires, okay? Now look on the natural side of it. Um, Robbie and Debbie, they've been desiring a home, a house, and now they have closed on it, right? And now they have a house. Yeah. <laughs> Joe and Sandy were desiring a house, and now they have a house. Amen? So, so God puts some good natural... It's a good thing to have a home, a house, if that's a desire of your heart, to have a better car, to take a vacation with your family. Like last week, I prophesied somebody who's not... You're going to have the money to go on a vacation. Why? Because those are good desires. They're not evil desires. Now, if I was like in, before... If I have a desire to go out and get drunk again and get in fights all the time and doing all that crazy stuff... That's fleshly desires. If I have a desire to sin, that's not a desire given from God. You understand what I'm saying? But to have a home is not a sin. To have a nice car 
to have a, a pay increase? How many of you are working for a job and like to have a nice pay increase? That's a good thing because God prospers you. Pray for the company you're working for, for therein you're blessed. And I'm telling you, so there's a twofold situation here. God knows we live in a physical world, but it says if we seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness, guess what? Your heavenly father already knows what you have need of, and he loves to fulfill it. So, you know, I'm just trying to tell you that don't get so super spiritual with this because God, your Father, knows we're in a fleshly world right now. We live in a flesh body. We have to have clothes and food and drink to take care of us. But he delights to take care of us. So if we delight in him, he can fulfill the desires of your heart. The most important desire for me, and it should be for you, is to know what he's called me to do and to do it. And he will if you desire him. But see, now watch this. If your desires are so much into the world, you won't hear him. If your desires are so much about you, you won't hear him because you're not delighting in him. Let me tell you about Job. I know Job is, you can, but I tell you at the end of Job, here's what happened. Job says, oh Lord, I've heard about you, now I know you, because I've seen you. The whole purpose was Job was for God to reveal himself to him. The whole purpose for our life is for God to reveal himself to us. It's the whole purpose of our life. So Jesus and our Father and the Holy Ghost can say, here I am, I want you to know me, you're my children, I want you to know everything about me. I've given you my word, my spirit. I've given you everything you need that pertains unto life and godliness. Amen. That's got to be the number one desire of your heart. And out of that, I guarantee you, you will begin to have a desire towards some type of ministry. Maybe it's hospitality. Maybe it's first, when I first started in the ministry. I mean, I had a desire to be a pastor. I became a pastor. But along the way... I, I did a lot of, I cleaned toilets, like I told you, in the churches, and I, I loved it. I just kept moving with God. I didn't expect God to make me Superman overnight. There's a lot of Supermen out there that can't fly because they're not in the spirit. I, let, I just always loved Jesus, and I still love him. I love him more every day. Now, in the, in the natural side of things, God can give you natural desires, a better home. I can guarantee you this, you ladies. I could visit everybody in this room. I could visit your house, and I visit some, and I guarantee you each house will be decorated a little bit different. Why? Because of your desires. You will decorate your house the way you want it, right? That's a desire of your heart. I, certain people like this. Or somebody likes this color. Somebody don't like that color. It doesn't matter if it's a desire of your heart. Your home becomes a reflection of who you are. Am I making sense? So I'm trying to encourage you this morning that in fulfilling our destiny, it's a twofold situation. Number one is to fulfill our destiny in Christ and to bring his love to this earth. That's our number one destiny on earth. And to each one of us know what part of the body we fit in. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, elder, deacon, helper. And the list goes on. What part of that are you? That's your number, that should be your number one reason for delighting in the Lord is to fulfill his purpose. The second one is, is God will bless you financially. He'll bless you. He'll take care of you. And that's what God wants to do because he does take care of us on this earth. So it's, all, it's not a selfish thing if you want a better home unless that's where your life is at. If you're putting your life based on where you live, then you're out of order. But if you put your life in Christ, he can put you in a place to live that you didn't think you could live there. I mean, I'm living in a house I never thought I could live in. All my cars are paid for. I, I, I am debt-free, basically, really. I mean, I could pay my house off tomorrow if I wanted to because of God's blessings in my life. When God called me into the ministry, the last thing I ever had, talked about was finances. There's only one job I ever had when we came here and went to work at Word of Faith that they said, here's what your salary is going to be. 
And it was less than what I was being paid in my church that I left in Kansas. And here we are down here paying a $222 house payment in Kansas to paying about $1,500 rent down here with less money. But thanks be to God. I just knew I was supposed to be here. I came, obeyed God. And he takes care of us, church. Yes. He takes care of us. I've got to uh, you understand, when you walk in the fullness of Christ and your desires will come from the Lord, there'll be a twofold desire. There'll be a supernatural desire of the gift and calling that's in your life. It's there. It's in you. The other will be, he will bless you. He will take care of you on this earth. He'll, he'll, he'll supply all your needs. He delights in that. He does not delight in poverty. He does not delight in sickness. He does not delight in condemnation. Church, he delights in blessing you. He's a blesser. But if the blessing overtakes the calling, then you'll become like Solomon. Because it says... When we walk in wisdom, it brings riches and honor and life. But the Bible says don't turn to the left or the right. Don't turn to the riches and honor. Don't turn to the life. Keep your eye on Christ who is wisdom. I've seen a lot of people derailed because when God began to bless them financially, all of a sudden they just quit coming to church and you don't see them. And next thing you see, they're in the world. They're drinking with everybody else. They're in the social clubs because they have all this money now. But see, you don't want that to happen and if you have the desire and the delight towards God, he can bless you beyond your wildest imagination. Why? Because you're not into the blessing, you're into delighting in the Lord. Am, am I making sense? So how are we going to fulfill this destiny? We're going to delight in the Lord, understanding that he's the one that purposed it in you. He's the one that will do it. We just have to believe it and act on it. But as I delight in the Lord, that desire becomes so strong in me. That's the key. Then the second verse says this. Now, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust in him, and he will bring it to pass. So there's, there's something here. We know that delighting is when we have a great desire to do something. We know desire is when we strongly desire something. But what about this word commitment? There's another word that goes right along with this called discipline. The base word of discipline is disciple. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to, he listen, hate, mother, father, wife, children, everything else. And what is he saying? Do we hate our parents? Never. But what he's saying is, if any relationship, it can even be your job. If any relationship means more to you than your relationship with him, Jesus is simply saying, you, you won't be my disciple. He wasn't saying, you're not my child, you're not going to heaven. He didn't say any of that. He said this. If you put any relationship above my relationship with you, you won't follow me. You'll follow the one whom you have the relationship with. Am I making sense? I know a lot of, of people that, that uh, over the 40 some years in the ministry, that their mate or their, their, their mate to be, their girlfriend or boyfriend is going to be their mate, captured more of their heart. And because of that relationship, the relationship with the Lord suffered. I know people that bound by their mother or their father. And because of the relationship with mother becomes stronger than the relationship with the Lord, you have this mom's voice in the back of your head. Still, your, your mom might be in with the Lord for years, and I guarantee you she can still be running your life because of a relationship. You want her approval. You want her so de desperately to prove mom, to, to, to prove somebody, and that relationship of approval from someone else can still control your life. Whereas if my relationship was with Jesus and there's no relationship greater than that, guess what? I'm a free man. I'm free from what other relationships could cost me in relationship to him. Am I making sense? So that can hinder your destiny. But if, but if he is your great relationship that you want more than the others, so when you take a delight and a desire, it turns into commitment, it turns into discipline. How many of you have played sports? Come on. What was required 
of sports. Well, number one, there was a coach that sometimes you hated him or her. I never had a woman coach. I always men coaches, but I guarantee you my football coach had his foot, you know where, so that we would do what we're supposed to do. Now, I had a choice to make. I could submit to that discipline of the coach and be a better football player, or I could be undisciplined, and if I'm undisciplined, I'm not going to make the team. So the athletes in the world, some of the most disciplined people on earth. Why? Because their delight, say an NFL player, from the time they're little boys, they wanted, they wanted to be a great NFL player, and so they, so they had the talent, and they, they high school, college, and here comes the NFL and the draft and everything, and, and they get called into the NFL. But I tell you, the only way they got there was discipline. Because they took what they delighted in, what they desired, and they committed their way to that. They committed their life to that. And as a result of it, they disciplined their body. And so it takes discipline to fulfill the destiny in our life. I have to be disciplined in the glory of God coming. I'm seeing it more and more. I'm seeing the... I'm just seeing it more and more on the inside of me. But it's taken 40-some years of discipline to not turn away from that vision God gave me. I've had to discipline myself to it. When I didn't want to, when I didn't feel like it, when it doesn't look like anything's happening, when people have said, oh, you know, I've heard this so many times, you know, you called Wolf, I don't even know, I'm tired of hearing it, I'm going to go somewhere else. But see, what you passionately love, you will commit yourself to that love. You will let that love discipline you. Because you have to go from delight to desire to commitment. I commit all, Lord. I commit all. Because you see, if you don't commit all, it'll hinder your destiny. You can, you can partially fulfill your destiny. You know, I'll give you some good news. Elijah only did one third of what God told him to do. When he ran away from Jezebel, says, oh God, cursed be the day I, I was born, you know, get me out of this mess. Well, guess what? The angel came, gave him food, says, just go on this 40 days, 40 nights. The journey's too difficult for you. In other words, the Lord is saying, the journey is too difficult for you. But he's given you supernatural food to do it. When he came to the Lord, the Lord told him to do three things. He said, I want you to go and anoint Elisha, with the, light, with the prophet mantle, I want you to go anoint Agab, the king. I want you to anoint Jehu. Elijah only anointed Elisha. He didn't anoint the king. He did not anoint Jehu. Why? I don't know, but he didn't do it. Elisha, the first thing Elisha did, because Elijah had probably told him all this, 17 years from when, when Elijah anointed Elisha, 17 years later, the Lord took him up into glory. For 17 years, Jezebel ruled and put people into bondage, killed the prophets. Had Elijah anointed Jehu when he was supposed to, Jezebel would have been dead 17 years earlier because the first thing Jehu did when Elisha anointed him is he went and killed Jezebel because that's what he was called to do. So the point I'm making is, is that church, Elijah still went into heaven alive. And I'm trying to encourage you in something. Don't get hung up with, well, maybe I haven't fulfilled everything God's called me to do. That's up to him to determine. Some good soil, some 30, some 60, some 100. I'm telling you right now, Elijah only produced 30-fold. He only did one-third of what God, and yet God said that's good soil. So don't get hung up with having to be perfect on this thing, but please understand that the more I walk in delight and desire and commitment to the Lord, 
I want, I, want to, I want it to produce a hundredfold, but it's only by His grace that that happens. That's my goal. That's what I want. And the only thing that can stop that is if I change my delight, if I change my desire, and I change my commitment, which I'm not going to do by the grace of God. So you go from delight to desire, and then you commit it to the Lord. And what does it say when we commit this to the Lord? Trust in Him, He'll bring it to pass. So what does that mean, trust? It means to believe in the, the reality or the ability or the truth or the strength or the desire of another person. So when I trust this to the Lord, when I, when I, what I delight in, what I desire... And when that comes, when I commit it to the Lord, now I have to trust the only one who can make it come to pass, and that's the Lord himself. So I don't put no trust in myself. I've done that a few times. It didn't work very good. Because I failed. I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the supernatural power. I didn't have the grace to do it. So what did I learn from that? It was God, not God, it was me. Don't get caught up, church. Some people have come and said, oh, God told me to do this, but he, he just, he just, God's not doing it, so they backslide. Well, one of two things happen. God told you, but you're not waiting. You're not trusting him with it, or God didn't tell you. Have enough spiritual sense when, if you do something and it wasn't God, just to say, God, I, I, that wasn't you. I've done things, and I finally realized that wasn't you, God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just more determined to know what is God. Amen. Well, fulfill your destiny. We'll go over the four points. Delight in Him. He'll put His desires in your heart for your destiny and to take care of you personally. Then you have to be disciplined and commit that to the Lord. What does that mean? That means that has to always stay first place and nothing happened in your life that'll take you away from it. And what happens, and the fourth thing is, as you commit it and trust the Lord with it, He, He will bring it to pass. Church, that'll work. That's how I live. That's why I'm where I'm at. And I know where I'm going. Because I live by these principles of delight, desire, commitment, and trust, knowing that God is faithful who called me, who will do it. Amen? Amen. Does that bless you? Amen. I want you to say this with me. Father, I thank you that you've given me the grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. And you've sent the Holy Spirit so that I can delight in you. I can have my desires governed by you. I can commit them to you. And I can trust you. Because you who have called me, you are faithful to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take Psalms 37, 4, and 5 and let that be a guidance in your life and you will begin to fulfill God's destiny in your life. Amen. How many of you are traveling over Thanksgiving? Some of you are traveling. How many of you have loved ones coming your way? Okay. Father, I lift up heaven's mercy upon those who are traveling to the loved ones and who are traveling here and those that are going. Place your angels over them. Give them safe journeys. Keep them safe, Lord, as they go and return. So that whenever we gather this Thursday, Father, I pray that there just be such a supernatural presence of God, that there truly will be a time of thanksgiving towards you and joining together as family. So I thank you for your divine protection. That this Thanksgiving, Lord, people can come and have a wonderful time as families. We give you thanks for all that you've done in our lives. 
Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Well, have a blessed remember Wednesday night.